Marsh from the United States joins us this week on the show. We have Craig and Rick from Marsh US. Let's get right into all the trials and tribulations that you as a transportation company are facing in the United States. Welcome to the Trucking Risk and Insurance Podcast. Craig, can you please introduce yourself? Happy to do so. Craig Dancer here with the Marsh Transportation Practice. I'm domiciled here in Washington, D.C. Oh, damn. There's lots of sh oh, stuff going on in Washington, <laughs> D.C. <laughs> I mean, help all the stuff for nothing. Uh, Rick, welcome to the show. Can you introduce yourself? Sure. Rick Reinel. I'm a national transportation industry practice leader for Marsh, and I'm based in Chattanooga, Tennessee. Well, there. Chattanooga sounds a little more or a little less exciting, perhaps. <laughs> less stuffy. <laughs> I'm with that. Uh, damn, it's going to be fun. Yeah. Look, we've got, so we're talking about transportation. Marsh is here. What are some of the biggest risks facing the industry today? How about I throw that at Rick? Fair enough. And a big part of our lives, obviously, are nuclear verdicts, which is getting to be a bit of a tired topic, but it's really not going anywhere anytime soon. And there's, you know, hope. It would be nice if there was a snooker bullet, but it's not. This is common dirty in the trenches, inch by inch kind of work. I think to protect ourselves. And unfortunately, the new term that a lot of people are using, uh, which is the product of the nuclear verdicts, is nuclear settlements. Uh, because we get all these advertised nuclear verdicts thrown at us. We don't know a lot about defense verdicts. Sometimes we get them. And we certainly don't know what's going on with settlements. We're all influenced by these giant verdicts. And there's a tendency to pay more than we used to um, for settlements. So nuclear settlements is, is the word today, which, of course, in turn, pushes the insurance market. Prices are up. Deductibles are up. And it's hard to figure out where you want to fit in in terms of moving your deductible up in today's world from 5,000 to 100,000, 100,000 to a million and, and on up. And that's a new way of doing business. And that ultimately, those that do that well, even if they don't want to, we're stuck with it. Those that do it well are, are going to excel. That's, uh, that's mm -hmm. my take. It, it's funny because I remember when I got into the insurance world 20 years ago, there was a term called shock loss. You know, anything mm -hmm. over a million dollars was a shock to the system. And, and it's funny because here we are 20 years later, and I'm still seeing a lot of trucking companies that have the same limits they did 20 years ago, but those losses are no longer a shock. They've become the nuclear type, right? So, yeah. and, and it just, it's fa just unfathomable how, how trucking companies are not taking a lot of this stuff seriously. It's a, to me, it's the issues, as Rick said, there's, there's no silver bullet on the horizon in terms of legislation. I mean, a couple of states, Texas, Florida, Iowa, have passed some level of tort reform, but it's going to be a wait and see to see what really genuinely happens. And, yeah. you know, not, not to feed the enemy, i.e. the insurance companies, but, you know, they're, to, their, to their position, unfortunately, when you look at the trucking environment, the legal environment that we're in, there's very little from a defense standpoint, other than getting much better defense counsel involved. But frankly, from a from a legal perspective, there's very little positive on the horizon. There might be some level of tort reform at a federal or a state level that's going to necessarily mitigate or limit some of these shock losses, nuclear, thermonuclear mm -hmm. verdicts and settlements. I think you know, to your to your point, the you know, some of the trucking companies have taken a position, and again, the non public we traded ones. These would be more your family ones and maybe some of the smaller ones. They're just not going to buy more limit because their philosophy, you know, they'll say is I'm just going to be asked for what my insurance limits are. And then that's, and then yeah. lo and behold, the creative plaintiff attorney sues me exactly for what my policy limits are. But I think what companies have to be concerned about in today's environment though, is particularly if you're a larger company and you have assets and meaning like you have more money than just a bunch of debt on your, your lease, on your leases for your trucks. They're going to go after you if the, if the accident's bad enough, and they're going to go after you outside of, you know, your insurance limit. Yes. Yeah. You know, and, and that, that, 
that's not only going to have an effect on um, on your operational side, but if they take you down, all those people that work for you now are, are out of jobs, you know? Um, so it doesn't take much very, very quickly to go down. Well, what's Agreed. happening now to commercial auto insurance market? Because, sorry, and let's just briefly define a nuclear verdict generally, as I understand it, is anything that settles for 10 million or more. So how is this all affecting the commercial auto market right now? Greg, you want to get? Yeah, yeah I'll, I'll, I'll chime in there. Um, yeah, it's, you know, if you look back the last 10 years, actually more than 10 years, you're seeing sort of a consistent rate increase on average in excess of 10, 15%. And yet insurance companies are still running what they refer to as combined ratios, which is the amount of premium that they take in versus the amount of loss and expense they pay out. It's still exceeding 100%. So, you know, you could say the 10% 10 compounded annual inflation rate on just just to begin the conversation still isn't enough for these insurance companies to make money. Now, that's looking at it writ large across the market. Obviously, some companies are doing better than others. But, you know, as Rick said, it, it, it's, it's, you're having to adjust to take more risk yourself as a, as a, as a motor carrier, not, not because you, you, you want to, to mitigate the cost. It's because in many instances you have to, because the insurance company is not going to give you that same deductible year over year. Mm-hmm. So that, that, that's been the biggest ratification. The, the second piece is really the, the amount of limit that's available. I mean, I would say, you know, to our largest motor carriers, you know, Back prior to 2018, 2017, you could go out and buy half a billion dollars of insurance coverage. Today, you'd be lucky to be able to buy 250 million. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, uh, the market is to say the word interesting. I think. <laughs> so, I'd say back in 2019 or 20 when it really started to harden. I'm not aware of a large motor carrier that didn't significantly reduce limits. Yeah. I think everybody's as low as they want to go for the most part. Not everybody, of course, everybody's a little different, but in general, we're not seeing much more reduction and Craig, maybe you've had a different experience. The conversation seems to have been about, all right, we're as low as we want to go. What's everybody else doing? Where, where should we be? Should we, stay? should we add to it? Um, should we find a different way to buy insurance, different way to have risk transfer? So we can better protect ourselves. That's that's today's conversation. And just yeah, hundred percent that... agree. I mean, there there's sort of this. There is a me too factor in this. Like you know, what is everybody else doing? That you know, kind of gives you comfort that you know mm-hmm. because you cut your limits in half or by seventy five percent. You know, over the you know that 2018, 29 time frame, and now you're kind of thinking you're looking at yourself with the rise in nuclear verdicts. Well, as a large company or even a mid-sized company, I mean, what is the right thing to do? And yeah, you know, we could model, we could model losses all day long and look at what that impact might be on your insurance program. And then absent your insurance program, how does that look in terms of being able to just pay for that loss if you had to put it on your own corporate balance sheet? Mm-hmm. It's a scare. I mean, it's a scary time for everybody because, you know, as we started the conversation, there's very little to say that the environment's changing for the better. As a, as a matter of fact, I would argue it's continuing to get worse. I think we had a brief pause with COVID, as we all kind of suspected there would be. And I think, you know, post-COVID, now that the courts are fully open, I, 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 I think that the, the stuff is accelerating even faster in terms of these bad verdicts. And, well, and, 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 uh, and unfortunately, we're kind of talking about large carriers here. We're missing the larger picture, which is smaller carriers, which obviously have smaller limits, right? And uh, and and with that comes less resources. And we find too much stuff is being fast track. You know, we're not probably qu- properly qualifying drivers. Uh, equipment's not being maintained as it should be because, well, we we know it's a tough market out there when it comes to freight rates as well. So we're seeing all all kinds of uh, shortening in different areas, which is. Well, it, it, it's going to come back to haunt us. Um, I, I just want to touch on real quick the incident that happened in Florida several years mm-hmm. ago to the tune of oh god, was it almost a billion? Me? Yeah, you know, it was ridiculous. The two carriers that were involved, each of them had less than five power units. Yep. So there was no money to be had for anybody out of that, 
The only people that won were the lawyers to be able to say, we got a billion dollar oh. verdict. Hey, but nobody collected, you know, barely a million dollars. It, it, it's okay. a shame. I mean, and, and that, you know, I think, you know, one of them was a Canadian carrier and the other one was yep. a U.S. based yep. carrier. And they're both, yep. I think, I think the Canadian carrier might still be in business, but the other one is, is definitely out of business. And that's, you know, when you're a small carrier like that, you're absolutely right. I mean, you know, the, trying to buy insurance on a single power unit or if you have five power units, you know, you're not, you're not, you don't have the resources to, to go into looking at different deductibles and that sort of thing. I mean, you're just hanging off for your life, trying to find and get, yep. you know, decent drivers to put into those seats. You know, and then hopefully you have enough money left over to invest in some cameras. Well, well to, and, and, and yeah. sadly enough, you know, a lot of these small carriers are are thinking, I'm being ripped off. You know, my premiums are too high, you know, and in comparison to what, you know, like you are one of the riskiest operators out there. So with that thought process, what can motor carriers do differently? What are yeah. some innovative ways that they could manage it? And you kind of touched on it there real quick, Craig, when you said cameras. Yeah, te technology of, of any kind, preferably technology that is engineering safety, like automatic emergency braking, things that don't require a lot of interaction. So they're passive systems. That, that's number one. And of course, we're, we're seeing that is going to be the likely legislated situation coming up, um, just like role stability control or electronic stability control was back in 2014 which is great, but it's not legislated yet. And a lot of people have, right. other, um, you know, pricing in the value. And even I'd say 10 years ago, it had no residual value. So you'd buy a truck that might have that technology, but you didn't get the value when you sold the truck back. Right. I think right. that's a lot different today. So I think there's a different equation as you evaluate that technology. And it certainly impresses underwriters as well to be able to speak to the fact that you have that, those passive systems. Those active systems, now we're into the cameras and being able to monitor your drivers. More importantly, those, the internal feedback to the driver, because the driver is the only one that can use the information right now. So right. if it's right. lane, lane detection warning, it's giving, the, sometimes it feels like too much feedback. Like that. <laughs> but receiving the feedback and putting you in a position where you can make better decisions is number one. Number two becomes the ability to monitor driver behavior for those fleets that have multiple drivers and those kind right. of resources. Yep. Yep. Uh oh, we lost Craig there. Well, Craig, Craig, Craig got a little older on the shrimp cake bowl. <laughs> there he is. We're back. That's cool. Sorry, we can edit that out know, easy enough. I mean, I'm in my office. I guess the uh, Marsh may have forgotten to pay the internet bill. I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Very strange. So we're just talking about technology and uses of technology. What are you seeing out there in the way of uh, technology? Is there anything, well, what's new and innovative? Do you see something out there that is is impressing underwriters? Well, there's a lot of check the box kind of approach going on and has been for a little while, meaning you don't have cameras, you may not get a quote. It's the price of admission. Uh, table stakes, mm -hmm. as I think Craig likes to, likes to call it. You're, you're not, there's no discussion to have unless you can check that box. Right. That's number one. And there's more and more of that going on. Right. Um, but the use of it, I think, is where we'll see more emphasis in the future. All right, you've got it. Now, prove to me that you're using it. Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. I think. Want to see some tangible results. I mean, exactly. I've yeah. seen some real good results with camera and the feedback mechanisms. Because as you're saying, Rick, really, cameras don't do shit <laughs> unless <laughs> the, you know, unless it's used and the feedback yeah. goes to the driver and the driver changes behavior. Like, it's yeah. kind of simple. But, there, there's people on our side of the table who have chosen to put some of those cameras in their own units to see how effective they are and what's been interesting to a person that I know that have done it. And it's all being done informally. It's just kind of an educational thing for themselves. Sure. Of course, working the, with the provider, you know, they want to hear the feedback and all of that. But to a person, they thought they were a great driver, but they're being told mm -hmm. a little differently. And mm -hmm. it's really kind of a kind of a funny moment for everybody to realize. Maybe I am 
a little faster in turns than I need to be, mm -hmm. or maybe I'm, maybe I am rolling through that stop sign when I really thought I stopped it. Mm -hmm. There's not a person yet who hasn't said, actually, I'm, I'm a better driver now for having that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, 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 almost, it's almost like I have, a, I have a, one of my kids is like, get, is starting to be the learning driving age. And that's like the worst person to have in your car with you is when they start going through driver's ed. <laughs> yeah, you just rolled that stop sign. Hey, you didn't come yeah. to a complete stop. You didn't look both ways before making that right turn. I'm uh -huh. like, you're probably almost as good as having a camera in the car. Yes, but yes. Yeah, exactly. behavior, behaviorally, it's funny. I mean, anecdotally, I, I remember, you know, back 10, 10 years ago when, Cameras are really just starting to you know, get into vehicles. And um, I would have so many clients tell me that when they implemented cameras for the first time and they're all watching the footage and they're like, damn, I thought John was our best driver. He just is yeah. our luckiest driver. Mm -hmm. He's actually a train wreck, you know? And yeah. it's like yep. the, the eye opening. And of course, now today, we're all most police are very used to the sort of cameras and that sort of initial phase. And I think if Rick hasn't already touched on it, when, during my, when I was, try to reboot the internet here uh you know the the ones that are really cool today i think are the, the self-coaching ai ones where yes. you know, there's yes. not an inward facing camera but there is a lens and it looks at th th the driver distraction component right there's an ai component that helps sort of you know, tr train the driver on on as you go but and i think as rick you know would point out you know it's not just the ai i mean you still need that in-person piece so the better camera providers, you know, not only have the AI, you know, self-coaching, but also have the ability to Im implement, you know, a tr you know, an alert to say the driver dispatcher, driver manager, that sort of thing. So that there's not only that in-cab immediacy, but there's also the post-drive or post-ride you know, debrief where, you know, a driver manager is able to say, hey, look, you, know, you had X number of, of incidents of distraction you know, what's going on today, you know, particularly if that driver wasn't somebody who was always on the radar before. And I think that's sort of, you know, another area where I think the new technology, it's not just the cameras, Rick said, the cameras don't do shit. It's, it's what you do with the camera data. And the, the, the companies that we, that Rick and I have been sort of investigating, you know, the, the better ones are the ones that really can take the load and burden off the driver managers and sort of help to provide more insights into, okay, here's your top 20 drivers that you got to focus on, you know, don't, don't, don't assign everybody the same training because not everybody needs the same training. So by having the ability to take the coaching aspects of these camera systems and then assign the individual drivers what they truly need, like dad needs rolling stop prop. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I've got rolling stop mm -hmm. issues. So. I should get training on rolling stops. Mm -hmm. I don't necessarily need training on, you know, speeding because I don't speed, right? right. So it's, it's kind of a thing. So I think yeah. that's what the really cool stuff about technology is today. Well, and some of the technology that's rolling out can automatically send the driver the appropriate training as well. Mm -hmm. right. That's right. You know, now how does that, so if I was a carrier and I had this, um, these cameras or this technology installed, and it's training my drivers through automation. How does the underwriter look at that? Is that, you know, because I'm going to spend money. Is it going to save me any money in the long run? No, number one question. So back to um, yeah. avoiding player verdicts. We didn't use that term. Avoiding player verdicts starts with the industry and having less accidents, right? So that's always the answer, honestly. Technology going to give me less accidents. That's number one. It, accidents take a while to develop into dollars. So there's not an immediate return, which will drive a trucking executive crazy because everything else in their life nearly is an immediate return. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Invest in this, I get it back this way. Um, and this it has a longest tail and it's close if it doesn't, but you, it takes some years to get that ROI. Back. And that is truly a challenge to the extent that underwriters find value in it. Historically and forever, it's really been, well, if you're having less accidents, you'll show up in your loss runs. And if it shows mm -hmm. up in your loss runs, you'll have less insurance. So the, the, the whole discussion that we're having is, well, if the information, the technology is giving you what's called the leading indicator, meaning more of these events equals more accidents, meaning less of these events equals less accidents. If that's true, you should be able to 
prove that somehow, right? I think that's what you're right or waiting for. As a, as, a, as a group, we haven't turned out a lot of great data. We could say cameras, put them in, they save you 30 to 60%. Well, that's, that's a little soft for what an underwriter needs, mm-hmm. right? Craig, thoughts? Yeah, no, I think it's, to Rick's point, I mean, it's, it's com- you know, you got to have the compelling data because the, the, the default for the insurance industry is, well, just give me, you know, your last 10 years of information and, you know, we'll put it in our black box, you know, swing, swing a cat around it and then come out with a number. Mm-hmm. And, you know, remarkably, whether you're a fleet, uh, you know, let, let's just say you, you have equal, you have three, three fleets that are all of the same ilk. And remarkably, their number is going to be pretty darn close to one another, even if one guy has slightly more experience, worse experience than another fleet. And, and really the default mode is in the insurance industry, as Rick said, you know, you're all going to be painted with this tainted brush Mm -hmm. because you're in the trucking industry until you can prove me otherwise wrong. Right. And even there, you know, the challenge is. The, the industry is just waiting for your next worst accident because, and they're going to price it accordingly. You, you could tell the markets that you got all the bells and the whistles and the driver assistance uh, technology in your trucks, the telematics in your trucks. And yeah, that, I mean, the underwriters love that. They'll eat that up, you know, mm-hmm. all day long. But as Rick says, until you can like illustrate that real hardcore numbers, to an underwriter and say, no, wait, look, we're not just talking about it. Here, here's the chart. Here's, you know, here's my yeah. reduction in frequency. Here's the reduction in my average severities. Then you're going to start piquing the underwriter's interest. Mm-hmm. But I think, you know, you're still being grouped macroly into this commercial auto trucking bucket that is going to be very difficult to overcome in terms of just what a baseline cost is going to be. You know, right. and, and the variability on that baseline cost for somebody that's really good versus somebody who's really bad or somebody has really good, you know, technology versus somebody that's just now investing in technology, that, that that's where you're going to see some variability. But again, it's not like, you know, the, the trucking executive is going to run home and say, yeah, I got a great deal and I feel good about it. Everybody's saying the same thing. The free market sucks. <laughs> you know, drug market sucks. Yeah, you know, and, yep. you know, and I and I get no respect. I'm Ronnie Dangerfield. You know, it's yeah. that's sort of the yep. that that's sort of the mindset, unfortunately. Uh, exactly. Well, we 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 we've seen the insurance market over the last whatever decades and whatnot has always been historically based. We're mm-hmm. starting to see uptick with some new insurance providers in a user based approach. What what are your thoughts on that? The technology joins in with the user based approach. Where do you think that's going? When do you think we're going to see that more rampant in insurance providers? Yeah, good go, right? Yeah, yeah. I was just going to say, you yeah, know, we we are working on. I mean, we have a road. We we developed this road facility. It's partnering with um, Inigo and Samsara, and really that it's about how much data mining can you do as an insurance company based on the telematics information that's coming back. Um, and that is relatively real time. So, you know, we're taking a data set, a macro data set. So you have your big data lake, and then you start looking at individual type, what they refer to as data tokens. So whether it's hours, geography, driving behaviors, maintenance issues, and how, how can we take those data points and really look at fleets that are performing better because of the usage of that data. Mm-hmm. And then if we can take that information along with, okay, my mileage information and some historical data from, from a driver perspective, yeah, we can probably build a much better mousetrap that A, would cost less upfront um, and be long-term more sustainable and predictable. Because that's ultimately what an insurance company wants. An insurance company wants to say, yeah. look, I don't want to I want a risk that I know long term is going to have an improved trajectory. And, you know, I think we all know there's only so much juice you can squeeze out of a lemon. But at the same time, you, you don't want to see the reverse occur where, you know, you kind of get that initial sort of, you know, interest from the drivers and, 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 and from the management and the technology. So you definitely see that initial 
decrease in frequency, severity, et cetera. But it's how long can you sustain that? And that's really where I think it goes back to, you can't just rely on the machinery. You got to go back and make sure and reinforce that, that training and so forth. But that is what the insurance companies are looking for. And, you know, the insure techs, you know, those are the ones that are really reliant on sort of the technology base. Yeah, they're all about usage base. They're, they're using some form of telematic camera systems to help that underwriting process. Um, we're trying to do that on a more macro basis in, in, in terms of trying not to parlay that into what we refer to as that umbrella and excess capacity, because that's really where we find the market has more or less been vacated, except for a very right. small few players. And, um, you know, again, it's, it's nascent. Um, it's, it's people willing to invest in technology and willing to see sort of how, how that plays out on, on a long-term basis. But yes, there is definitely interest and the insurance industry knows there has to be a different story. We can't just continue on. That is the definition of insanity, right? We just continue keep yeah. doing the same yeah. we keep doing without it changing. Well, it, but this is where it's a great opportunity for motor carriers to get on the bandwagon now you know, work with their insurance partners, like brokers, like Marsh and whatnot, to implement these strategies and programs so that the deliverables can be provided to their insurance providers, you know, the insurance companies and whatnot, to be able to say, we are making a difference. We are able to show. And at the same time, hey, we're getting an ROI on the other end. Oh, just exactly. Right. I, I really think trucking companies do a terrible job at marketing their strengths to insurers um, and using technology would be one of the ways that they could differentiate their company from everybody else and perhaps get uh, a better return. Does that kind of lead us in as we've got to wrap this up in a minute or two? Um, Marsh Road Transport Facility. Who wants to handle that one and say, well, this is what Marsh Road Transport Facility is all about. Craig, go go. So I'll, I get I got to walk into I joined Marsh this year into what I thought was an amazing idea, and Craig was a big part of it. So Craig, take the lead on that, and I'll supplement as we go along. Yeah, I mean, it's it's exactly what we want to do, and what will transform I think the industry writ large in terms of how they approach risk and underwrite risk. And that is relying on the here and now data and having direct linkage between what is coming in from the telematics data, what is residing in the you know motor carrier's internal house for, from a safety standpoint, and saying, look, you know, we're not just talking the talk. I mean, we're actually working day to day, understanding what the data is. And then using that data to have direct, individual, bespoke, um, you know, conversations with our drivers, which is changing our risk profile. And for companies that are willing to do that and willing to make those ROI investments, there is an app, there is an insurance outcome for that, which is this new road facility we, we refer to. And again, it is a partnership with a technology provider and a insurance company out of out of Lloyd's of London to provide this new new product. And again, it's not, it's it's for that it was in, it was prepared for the trucking industry because that's obviously been the most distressed. But as the contagion of, of nuclear verdicts has spread beyond dedicated for higher trucking, it's it's really targeting not only just the for higher trucking space, but it's 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 targeting really private fleets that have large, you know, that have large private private heavy 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 truck operations. So because it's unfortunate that now the insurance industry just sort of sort of looks at fleet as just it's just a you know it's a, it's a challenging risk environment and mm -hmm. you know, to your point our clients probably don't spend enough time talking about what they're really doing hey. and I think this product again if, if they're if they're making the proper investments will give them a heck of a lot greater visibility into what's going on inside the truck as well as, you know, helping to leverage that with, with the insurance market. Well, I was going to say one of the added bonuses here is, and, and we're starting to hear more of this. So to kind of go back to what Rick mentioned in the beginning, nuclear verdicts. And if I can't find enough money 
in that transportation pocket, I'm going deeper. So I'm going to look at the shipper. I'm going to look at the receiver. I'm going to look at the freight broker. Where'd the freight come from? So this is a great opportunity for small carriers, particularly and the midsize even, doesn't matter, any size operation to do a better job and utilize this tool, not only to market themselves to the insurance world, but also to their clients, to be able to say, this is what we do, not only to make ourselves better, but also to protect you from that inevitable that could happen. And, and we've seen so many of these nuclear verdicts where it was not the transport truck's fault. You just happened to be there at the right time and the jury decided, boom, you're getting slapped, right? Um, and no company that wants to move their product wants to be associated with a company, trucking company, that is all over the front page news, you know? So knowing that, wow, these guys are doing a better job. They're managing that risk. They're utilizing that telematics would help those shippers and receivers and clients pick a better carrier. That's what I love about this facility because Inigo's all in on bringing that data back in front of you. Right. So let's face it. If you're a trucking company, you're good at trucking. You're not necessarily yeah. good at data management yep. on, on such a thing. So fortunately, Inigo has a ton of data scientists and they're willing to benchmark all that data sure. and bring it back. And because they're using just limited data fields and they're the same data fields and everybody that has Samsung units, it's, it's accurate benchmarking. So they've shared sure. a number just as an example that they get the 120 hard breaks equals an accident. So mm. but they have, Sam Zora has the data, but they're also yep. receiving the loss run. So right. they're, they're in a, we're in a seat right there. So, so is the motor carrier. Sure. They're just sure. They're just good at it right now. Yeah. So there'll be, yeah. there'll be some lessons learned, I think for everybody that adopts this product and gets that benchmarking back from Inigo, it's different than what you get from anywhere else. Cause it's been through that process and it's been compared right. to all the other submissions they've gotten. So I, I think, I think there's a lot to learn here. We, and we don't do a great job. I'll see a presentation that's often put together and it's about 80 or 90% on the business. This is the renewal presentation, you know, from the, from those truckers that get in front of their underwriters and do a presentation, yeah. 80 or 90% about the business. And there's one slide talking about their partnerships, <laughs> but no data, no data at all. Well, they haven't had the data. It's understandable. Yeah. And yeah. frankly, we do the same thing with juries, you know, yep. the, yeah. The plaintiff can make up whatever they want. Say every, every, um, hard break was essentially an accident. You should have fired the guy after two. Well, they're just mm -hmm. making, it. They, they have yep. no idea, but we don't yep. do a good job countering it. So I think as this data comes out, really gives us ties, those leading indicators to accidents and puts us in a position to talk about it with underwriters, customers, as you said, and, and juries. I yeah. think we're putting ourselves in a much better position. So to me, this is, this is yep. thrilling. Like I said, I was so glad to walk in and see all this yeah. great work to get put together. Cool. Well, that well like you say, it's benchmarking. Mm -hmm. That is the Marsh Road Transport Facility. So for our listeners cool. and watchers, if you want more information about it, should they reach out to Craig and Rick? Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, well, we're easy to find. We're on the Marsh website or, um, or you well, can probably just do an internet search for us. It's pretty easy. Your info will be in the show notes down below. So Perfect. it'll be kind of easy for anybody who wants to reach out to Marsh and to uh, Craig and Rick in particular. Your info is down below. So do that and reach out. That was a great uh, interview. Thanks, Craig and Rick from Marsh US. Uh, and if you got value from it, please click a like and subscribe and we will see you next week. That's all.